I'm actually back at the church which I visited some years ago, in fact six years ago, it's Little Wenham Church, which was once part of a village which, like many other churches, has sadly slipped away into time and became redundant. At one point in its history, it was openly discussed about its future, whether to demolish this old church or whether to allow her to stand. Unfortunately, the local people here decided quite wisely that this church, which is actually of national importance, is a grade one listed building, should survive. And here she is today. Rather than for me to drone on about the history and about the artifacts which exist here today, here is an earlier video which I shot here which gives you all of that information plus more and a church which I can say is very, very haunted, as will be explained in the video. As you can see, I'm in an absolutely splendid and wonderful location. In fact, I'm at All Saints Church, which is located in the village of Little Wenham in Suffolk. And when I say village, let's talk more of a hamlet, because the actual church is surrounded by farm buildings. In fact, over the back is also a stone-built house, Little Wenham Hall. The house and the church were built relative to each other in the 13th century. What is particularly unique about both buildings is that both contain examples of early English brick. In fact, some of the earliest recorded early English brick. Previously, when churches were being constructed, they attempted to use any local material that they could find available to them. And in this part of the world, the most common was, of course, the remains of Roman houses. And so from that material, which was stone rubble, from tiles, from, from brick, they were able to construct these wonderful buildings. However, in this example, it is purely English, and the church has a very strong feeling of early English Gothic and it kind of flows through it. Almost, I would say, this church is full of many idiosyncrasies. I mean, particularly so with some of the wall paintings that have been discovered. The story here was that in the 1960s, one of the church regulars discovered that the paint peeling revealed the traces of early wall paintings beneath. And since being in the care of the Church's Conservation Trust and being declared redundant in 1976, considerable renovation work has taken place in this wonderful building to reveal all of these ancient wall paintings. And of course, as one would expect, with the passage of time and over the centuries, the original bright and almost vivid wall colours have faded into very dull ochres. But even so, one is still able to see quite clearly what is left of them, the saints who are depicted. What I'm hoping to do with you today is to take you around this wonderful building and to reveal to you some of these wall paintings and anything else which I would consider relevant to my excursion here today. And what a wonderful place to have that excursion. Although it's very dull outside, we've just experienced tremendous storms in the last few days, and it's very dark in here, we've been able to rely upon additional lighting and other techniques to be able to share with you some of these wonderful pictures. <laughs> The first thing to notice with these three wall paintings is that the figurines have black faces and black hands and when they actually painted these faces they used a red and white pigment in lead paint and they were preserved in that colour for centuries and centuries until they actually removed the covering and of course the pigmentation is oxidised with the air and it's caused the figures' faces to turn black. But having set that to one side, this is still a fascinating capture of three famous saints which have been really pertinent to the period in which they were painted. And uh, the first one here is St. Margaret, who is actually spearing a dragon. Now what's particularly interesting about St. Margaret is that the influence of actually spearing the dragon 
draws its emphasis mostly from the Eastern Orthodox Church rather than the Western Orthodox. And I've noticed on some of my forays into churches and ancient buildings that much of the architecture draws very heavily upon earlier buildings created in the Middle East, and particularly at Bradbury in Essex, is St. Peter's Church, which I believe was built in 654 AD. And its influence and design was drawn from churches in Syria and not in England. And yet here we're going, we have what could possibly be a Middle Eastern Christian influence over the artwork of this church, which would also suggest that the painter, or presumably some of those connected with the church, may have served overseas. An example, of course, would be the Crusades and the Crusaders themselves. And so this is quite a unique figure. In fact, I'm not sure. I believe it's the only one of its type known in England. And sure enough, here she is spearing a dragon. Now, what is the political significance of this figurine? As indeed with the other figurines, which I will come to very shortly. Apart from their religious overtones, they also represented something else. Quite clearly, Margaret represents strength the power of the church, to vanquish all evils. The evils in this case is the actual dragon, and the dragon would have been the non-believer, the Muslim, or the Jew, or indeed anybody else of any other religion. In the middle panel, we have a depiction of St. Catherine, and in one hand, she's holding the will. And this representation, the will, is actually the will of life which we all pass through as our lives revolve round in one continuous circle from the beginning and to the end, with all the events which take place in that life, and particularly so how we are equipped to deal with ourselves and the world around us. And so many, many people, particularly those coming back from service in the Middle East, have died of all kinds of diseases. The worst, of course, during that period was leprosy. And let's take us on to the next figure. And that depicts Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene is holding an ointment jar. Now, there is a religious significance to the ointment jar and to Mary Magdalene, obviously. But there's an extra significance to it because the ointment jar, if you like, this is a saint who people would touch. The ointment jar represents a cure from disease a cure from all kinds of ailments. And this is based purely and driven purely by people's religious beliefs. The belief that as they've been found by any known medical men of the period around them, that they turn to the church in their desperation to be saved. And here this figure is holding that ointment jar. So there is another significance here, and it is very relevant for the period of history that we're talking about. I find all three paintings absolutely wonderful. And if you look very, very closely at detail, you can see the folds and the cloth, and you can see the characters and quite the expressions in their faces, which sadly are darkened with age. But what is still fresh about them is the hair colouring. The hair still stands out. So this is a wonderful representation of three famous saints. And again, extremely rare depictions hardly found anywhere else in Britain. Let's move over to the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. And this depiction is probably better than the other three saints put together. Here we have the Virgin Mary with baby Jesus, lovely being cuddled by her. And looking on at either side are two saints. Quite who these two saints are, I honestly don't know but it's indicative of the round light halos around each of the figures' heads. There really isn't much you can say about this. This is a statement of religion. This is a statement of purpose. And it is also a sign to many, many poor people of hope and inspiration. And I think to a degree in that period, this is what she actually represented. And of course, with Jesus, also represents life eternal. And each of these is either side of the main chancel window. But what wonderful depictions. And to think 
that they've existed for centuries without any detection until the 1960s when through poverty and neglect of the church it actually exposed these wonderful wall paintings which had long been forgotten since the reformation of the church. And our last saint to meet today, in fact, is the one who greets you as you walk through the door. And in fact, I'm actually named after him. It's St. Christopher. This is a particularly rare and very unusual find. The wall paintings here date to relatively the same period in the 14th century. And even so, despite the age and despite its wear and the deterioration which has taken place over the centuries, the colours are still quite bright and the imagery, particularly around the faces of St. Christopher himself and baby Jesus. As you can see, it's painted on the south wall which greets the visitor as they come through the church door from the north side. And this is a traditional view of St. Christopher and here it looks as though he's either holding the baby Jesus and this would have been seen or perceived as a good luck charm for anybody who comes into the church. And so as people came through the door, here painted on the wall is St. Christopher. And although much of it has deteriorated, the quality and the expression of the face and the baby is still quite very real. And you can pick up quite some detail. And in fact, if you look at St. Christopher's face, he almost looks like he's in homage to the baby Jesus. This is a particularly fine example and very rare in English churches because most have disappeared since the Reformation and have been literally wiped from history. But here we have this large depiction, and what a wonderful image it is. And of course the biggest problem with this, it has no gas or electric, so it has no means of keeping the building warm and dry other than the roof, is what happens in future centuries as more and more of this paintwork starts to deteriorate. And that is the big question mark which is facing the conservators of the charity who is responsible, which is the Church's Conservation Trust. And sadly, there are many churches like this containing many, many fine wall paintings and other historic details, which, unless they're looked after and unless they're maintained, are going to fade from the annals of history. My views of this church so far I'm extremely impressed, despite its age, the fact that it hasn't been used for years for regular worship, but it still contains such a wonderful energy. And there's still one or two other tombs and monuments here to greet the visitor as they come to this church. Here is a tomb and monument to John Bruce who was buried here in 1585. The Bruce family were a very powerful local family. In fact, they lived at Little Wenham Hall, which is next door, and obviously this was their local church. But what is particularly fine about this is the smaller details here, such as the spurs. Many churches that I've been to, which have similar monuments, have suffered excessively from damage over the centuries, and yet this is almost immaculate, complete with coat of arms, and with these faux, and they are faux, marble panels. They're actually painted. But even so, the craftsmanship and the execution of the figurine, the face and the body, and the whole background to this piece is quite impressive, to say the very least. And this is something, this is artwork that you can actually approach, you can actually touch it. It's not in a museum. If you like, you can regard these buildings as living museums because they continue forever forward. And all of these wonderful exhibits are here and available for people to come and to enjoy them. One thing that struck me about my visit to this church and my last investigation, we went over to Duxford Church. And that church was the epitome of military hell. There was so much in that church which gave strong militaristic appeal. In fact, it was believed to be connected at some point with the Knights Templar. Here, the significance is completely changed. The emphasis has been taken away from war, from death, from purging people and sending them to hell.
This church has a very feminine touch, a very gentle touch to it. There's nothing aggressive in this church. There's nothing that indicates war or malice or a forethought, as they did in the early days. This is a very peaceful, very loving building, whereas Duxford had that hard-edge militaristic appeal. And nowhere finer is that you can see that in the artwork of this building. There are no demons. There are no people being dragged off to hell. There is no message of warning to those who do not conform to the teachings of the church. Nothing of the sort. And this is the general feeling, the general ambience of this church all the way through. A very warm and very peaceful church. But there is a slightly and dare I say this, sinister side to it, and the sinister side being that when we were in here earlier setting up cameras, we quite clearly both heard a lady say, shh! And uh, that did quite take us back by shock, only momentarily. But while we've been in here filming today, and this is essentially a documentary about the history of this building, it has nothing to do with the paranormal per se in a direct manner, but we are picking up experiences of it. And these indications have been whispering, we've heard voices, and appear to be a lady in this church. And these voices are very loud and very clear. On a couple of occasions, we were actually minded to believe that there may have been somebody else inside the church, but there is nobody else here. In fact, the last visitor, according to the book, was over two days ago. But for an experience, this is something which is much better shared. And I'm glad that you've joined me on this visit today. You love these stairs up to the uh, rude loft which uh, as you can see here I'm not going to venture up those stairs and the opening here is at the top and this beautiful brass is one of the best preserved in the United Kingdom in years past people would, after the Reformation, they would come to these brasses of these long dead lords and knights and ladies and they would rip the brass out of them to sell, just leaving gaping holes. But this is almost uniquely preserved, absolutely splendid. fascinates me when I come in here is this stone slab with the impression of a sword or crucifix on the lid probably dates to around the 14th century and indeed it may have belonged to one of the knights that traveled out to the Middle East during the Crusades or simply it may have been one of the local landed gentry but whoever it was this relic of the past exists today. It's beautiful, isn't it? A medieval font. And you can still see traces of the original paint, which is extremely rare. This is on par with the war paintings, around about the same period. But of course, there are no discerning patterns left. Just discoloration, unfortunately but the colors still remain. The ochres are still there. I love this 
church. It's so beautiful. It has so much charm, so much history. And ingrained within this building are perhaps so many stories, so many experiences. And those that sit in solitude inside this church can feel that energy, that power. Churches are a reliquary of British history with regard to the church and social development and attitudes, of course. And the only memorials that we see today are those paid for by the wealthy. The millions of poor over the centuries have simply come and gone and have been obliterated into history. But still there is some semblance of the past, and particularly so in this church, this fine Gothic building. I worry for the future of these buildings. I worry what is going to happen in the long term as people turn their backs on religious worship, on Christianity. What will happen to these buildings? This is one of those buildings that's been abandoned. It no longer serves the purpose it was created for. When I first came here, we set up cameras, but just prior to that, we were discussing where we were going to shoot, what positions we were going to take, and this female voice told us to shh. Very clearly, very audibly. But she seemed reluctant after that to make an appearance. While shooting inside this ancient building, it was quite apparent by the atmosphere that the church is indeed very much haunted. Throughout my time there, I heard whispering and felt a degree of temperature change, but nothing threatening or unwelcoming. I felt they, the spirits, treated my visit as some cause for amusement. I purposely did not reach out to them, as the last time I did so, they remained very quiet. So, on this occasion, I acted as any normal visitor would, to see whether or not they would reveal themselves in one way or another. I set up two additional camcorders, one which was placed facing the door, and the other which was placed fairly centrally to the aisle, and pointed towards the pulpit. And as you will see in here, they made their presence felt. From the very start, I collected this EVP as I was setting up with a very loud huh. <laughs> this huh appeared throughout my visit at varying points, sometimes in acknowledgement to a historical statement made. What was rather funny on review was this capture of a bad attempt at whistling, followed by a laugh. The only variance to the captured EVP was this female voice which appears as I was walking. What she's actually saying isn't very clear. But the very best, in my opinion, was a partial manifestation near an 18th century pulpit. As a singular view in passing, it doesn't appear very significant. It seems to come from a fold in time itself within the recessed window edge and quickly into the back of the pulpit. Closer inspection actually shows three events. The main event in slow-mo. As it appears, it curls over quickly and displays a stunted curve by which the next frame becomes fuller as it stretches. And in this shot, it becomes more flatter as a curve as it enters the pulpit. 
But what of the two other events? Well, let's look at them more closely. Before the anomaly appears to the left, another light anomaly appears to the right of the pulpit, as shown here. And very quickly after it shows as a small white vertical line in the middle, it goes back to the left, where the main body appears. Now for the skeptics. My body was clear of the pulpit with the camera pointed forwards before the anomaly initiated its appearance. Further, I was shielded by the low remains of the screen wall. There, as illustrated, is no cause for this anomaly by my body, and added to that by its very nature, it wasn't an explainable dust moat. A very interesting attempt, I feel, of a partial manifestation. Sadly, my time here today has come to an end. I thoroughly enjoyed the experience of being here and soaking up this wonderful atmosphere that permeates from the walls. It's very, very cold, but that chill has with it a benign warmth that you can feel inside this building. And uh, if you ever get the opportunity to visit, I would wholeheartedly recommend that you do so. And so it's time for me to return, and of course, I will speak to you again during the next time I'm out somewhere interesting with my camera and my thoughts. Thank you.